the type of this conversation has been right. We don't know what to call ourselves anymore. We all are pitching at sure. economics. Sure. Good evening. Sure. We'll be starting the Bothell Planning Commission meeting for Wednesday, October 29th, 2014. We are now called to order. All commissioners are present except for Commissioner Booth, who is absent and excused. That, do we, we have any non-agenda public comments? Seeing none. Uh, any uh, approval of minutes? Don't believe we have any. So uh, any new business? None. So we are now at the continued public hearing on the 2015 periodic plan and code update. So at this point, Gary, do you uh, process wise, is there a presentation that you would like to make or do I need to make a motion to open this? Um, yes, you could please open the public hearing and I'll be glad to take it from there. Oh, okay. Entertain a motion to open the public hearing for tonight? I think all you gotta do is just open, you just oh, open it. Okay. Just an opening statement. Okay. We're opening the public hearing for the 2015 periodic plan and code update. Thank you. Good evening, Commission. Um, as you can see, we have two guests with us tonight. I'll introduce them first and then um, give you a brief introduction to the topic tonight. Um, on my far left, uh, your far right, is uh, uh, Elliot Wiseman of Community Attributes. Elliot is a planning analyst, and Elliot will provide a, a a presentation for you tonight on the analysis that his firm has done for us on both the King County and Snohomish County portions of the city uh, with regards to uh, the transfer of development rights, which is the, the main topic of conversation tonight. Uh, on my close left is Darren Greedy. Darren is the TDR uh, Program and Mitigation Supervisor for King County, um, and he will give you a, a brief presentation um, at, a, at a higher level on, on TDR and the Alclip Program. Uh, before I hand it over to Darren, um, <clears throat> in your packet I've mentioned that, that what we're looking for tonight from, from you guys is, is fairly simple. We want to give you a presentation on, the, the, on an overview of uh, transfer of development rights and the LCLIP program. You've had sort of a 90,000 foot look um, from me and Bill earlier in the year. Um, that was about our level of expertise in this. Darren and Elliot have a lot more expertise. So Darren will bring us down a little bit, and then Elliot's going to put it put us pretty much into the into the middle of the into the grass down by the roots. So um, your opportunity to ask questions about TDR and LCLIP is is here in front of you with um, with these two gentlemen. So we'd like to give you their presentations and simply have you um, ask any questions that you need to, so that you you feel that you understand the issues better. Um, Take public testimony if, if there's any to take. At the moment, it appears there is not. And then if you feel comfortable giving us some feedback on your thoughts on TDR and LCLIP, we, we would love to hear your thoughts. Um, we have our own thoughts, um, which I'll share with you um, as you get into your deliberations. But, but obviously, if, if you guys would like to give us any feedback, that would be invaluable to us. So with that, I'll hand over to Darren. He's going to go over to the podium and give you a brief presentation, and we'll take it from there. Okay. Um, well, uh, let me start by first uh, thanking you all. Thank you, commissioners, for uh, and Gary for uh, for hosting me this evening and uh, and letting me come and speak with you about this uh, rather arcane topic. Um, my goal and challenge tonight is to try and take an otherwise tricky concept of growth management and boil it down into. Um, the basics of what we're trying to achieve and how it works and how we've applied this in King County for over a decade now. Um, Gary, I think it was just about a year ago I was at this podium speaking to the City Council in regards to looking at TDR policies or transfer development rights policies um, for the King County portion of the City of Bothell and, and if and how a partnership between the, the city and the county could be structured um, around uh, a new tool that I'm going to spend uh, a bit of time talking with you about um, that would help the city fund infrastructure um, in the Bothell Landing area. 
But let me back up for a second. I'm going to talk with you about for about 10 minutes on, on two topics, TDR, what it is, how it works. And then I'm going to talk with you about a new state law that passed in 2011 that links the concept of transfer development rights with what I call a form of tax increment financing. Two independent ideas that are tricky on their own, combining them um, adds a layer of complexity. But between myself and Elliot, we're hoping to, to bring, boil that down uh, to a certain level of understanding uh, for you all tonight. Let's see. So TDR is an acronym for Transfer of Development Rights. It's simply put, it's a growth management and land conservation tool boiled into one. And the basic concept is to steer development growth out of our rural and resource lands, our ag lands, our forest lands, our rural open space lands, steer that development potential out of those areas into urban growth areas. Um, that's the fundamental premise of transferring development rights. But it does this in a unique way. It does this by creating a marketplace whereby instead of the public spending a lot of public dollars um, acquiring open space lands and protecting it through either acquisition or easement acquisitions, we create a marketplace whereby developers, private developers, are acquiring privately owned development rights in exchange for building uh, more densely, more compactly in our urban growth area, either taller buildings or more additional units in a subdivision or short plat. That's the receiving site side of the equation, the demand side of a TDR market. On the left-hand side of the slide here is developers willing to pay a certain amount of money to build taller buildings, build more units. On the supply side of the TDR market is what we call the sending sites. Those are the, uh, the farmlands, the forest landowners who willingly, voluntarily, uh, put a conservation easement on their land, on their property, in exchange for that conservation easement that permanently removes the right to subdivide and develop that farm, the county issues that landowner what's called a transferable development right. It's, this is a commodity created by King County given to that landowner in exchange for putting a conservation easement on their land. That commodity is fungible, can be bought and sold just like land can be bought and sold. And that landowner then you know, sells it to a developer, uh, uh, transferring that development right out of those areas that we want to protect into the areas we want to accommodate new growth. The county has been doing this for well over a decade. We adopted TDR program policies and code in 2000, actually 1999 and 2000. And we've been doing this uh, for 14 years now. Um, and we've been doing it in both unincorporated urban areas as our de facto receiving sites but also, as I'm going to talk about in my next slide, a handful of partner cities doing interjurisdictional development right transfers um, into urban centers of cities that partner with us. And that was the premise of me coming to the city with Gary um, last year and engage in the city manager and engaging uh, in this conversation. And we provided um, about $20,000 of grant funds to pay for community attributes to do an in-depth analysis of, of seeing if and how this can work, what are the economic feasibility of this tax increment financing component, how that could work in Bothell Landing. And the results of that I'm going to leave to Elliot to speak to tonight, but it led to, hey, let's look across the border in Snohomish County to see if this could work in, in a more ripe part of the city um, for, for density and development growth. Um, as I said, you know, the county has been doing this for over a decade. Our, our receiving sites, the areas of urban, unincorporated King County, where the county has zoning control, uh, we've transferred, um, you know, well over 400 development r units into the unincorporated urban areas. We've protected um, about 140,000 acres of land through our TDR program. 
But we've also engaged a handful of cities to partner with us on this effort. These five cities um, have entered interlocal agreements with King County to accept development rights from rural King County in exchange for changing their zoning code to allow those developers to buy this TDR commodity to build more compactly in their city. City of Issaquah, um, city, of, city of Issaquah, the area is focused on their central business district in downtown. That's the area if you're driving eastbound on I-90, the area north right abutting I-90 there is a receiving area for King County TDRs from the Issaquah Creek Basin. Um, that's a rural area outside of the city that the city leaders decided, hey, there's a nexus between the rural area of King County and the city because Issaquah Creek flows right through that, right through downtown Issaquah. The city of Bellevue, uh, we entered an agreement uh, with Bellevue in 2009 for the Bell Red Corridor. In anticipation of the Sound Transit Line coming through there, the city went through a very extensive sub-area plan process, much like you guys have done with Bothell Landing, increased the zoning, changed the zoning in the land use, and part of that is a TDR component with King County for increasing floor area ratios in Bell Red through developer purchases of TDR from areas in the mountains to Sound Greenway. That is what the city of Bellevue elected officials wanted to see protected through TDR. The forested hillsides along the mountains of Sound Greenway on I-90 are the sending areas for Bell Red developers. The city of Sammamish kept things a little closer to home. Their town center development, which is another lengthy sub-area plan process that they went through over the last three, four years, really significantly increasing the zoning in their town center uh, area, and TDR is similarly a component of that. And they want to pull rural development rights from what, from what their mayor calls their emerald necklace, which is that little band of rural area that buffers the city edge from the rest of the, the, the rural area for passive parks and recreational opportunities. City of Seattle, we've recently partnered with Seattle. And, and of all the cities on this slide, the Seattle is our most recent interlocal agreement and the, and the, the only one to date uh, that has entered into LCLIP tax increment financing partnership with us. And the reason that is is simply these other agreements went into effect before LCLIP was passed by the state legislature. Um, and this, the receiving area in Seattle is South Lake Union. Um, those of you who've been through South Lake Union recently, uh, counting the number of crane, cranes in the air is, is, I'm starting to lose digits uh, to do that, but, but those developers are buying development rights from farmlands in King County. The, the impetus behind the city of Seattle in partnering with the county on TDR was to protect those farmlands that are under threat of development that supply the city's farmers markets, restaurants, and retailers with local produce. So we're targeting those as the development right sending areas for South Lake Union developers to build their taller buildings um, and achieve that growth management landscape conservation aspect. The little tiny city of Normandy Park. So this, this whole thing called TDR works on a big scale for a big city and it also works on a small scale for a small city like the city of Normandy Park. Um, they, like the uh, city of Sammamish, created a, their Manhattan Village sub-area. They increased the density. They required developers to buy TDRs from the shorelines of Vashon Island, which is the viewshed of the city of Normandy Park. You, if you're on Vashon, if you're on city of Normandy Park, you, the first thing you see when you look across the Puget Sound is the shorelines of Vashon Island. So they want to accept density and development rights from, to keep that a forested island and allow uh, little taller buildings in their Manhattan Village. Your neighbor to the south, the city of Kirkland. Uh, we worked with them. We've provided them, similar to you guys, with some grant funds to consider the LCLIP tool and TDR tool for their Totem Lake uh, Urban Center. And they are considering that as part of their 2015 comprehensive plan update. So they don't have anything. We don't have an interlocal agreement in place with Kirk and Lett. They wanted to hold and, and, and move through their comprehensive plan process before doing anything like that. <coughs> So that's kind of the first part of my talk with you, what TDR is, how it's worked, 
what the city partners have been like in King County over the past decade. The, the ground shifted a little bit in 2011 when a, a new tool became available that we, King County, was a strong advocate and supporter for down in Olympia when the legislature passed uh, the Landscape Conservation and Local Infrastructure Program. That's a mouthful, but it's LCLIP for short. And this is the, what I call TDR.2.0, um, which is taking TDR and adding a really strong component that we feel um, can act to encourage cities to really partner with us. Um, and the reason being is because it provides you, a city, with a new, brand new revenue stream to fund important infrastructure projects. The, the bill itself was in Gross Senate Bill 5253. Only certain cities, let me back up, only city, certain cities within the three county region of Puget Sound, so Pierce, King, and Snohomish are eligible. The cities have to have a population and employment number together that totals 22,500. And the focus is on moving development rights into the cities from the rural parts of the county. As I said, this creates a new revenue stream whoops, for the city. And let me be clear on this point. By new revenue stream, I am talking about the county's general fund property tax revenue. Through this tool, the county is agreeing to transfer a portion of its general fund property tax revenues to the city for the city to invest in infrastructure in the district that it draws. Up to 75% of the county's portion of its general fund property tax revenue could be transferred to the city from new construction in a district that, that the city draws. That district cannot exceed 25% of the total assessed value of the city. So let me back up. The city draws a district. All new construction in that district, depending on how many TDRs the city agrees to take, and that's my next slide, that determines how much of the county's property tax revenue um, you can capture. It's up to 75%. And this, go, and this is a 25-year program. So the, the thinking here is there's a potential to bond for this new revenue stream. But the bonding potential is predicated on how strong the real estate market's going to be. I think a conservative bond council would say, city, be very careful about bonding on this revenue stream because it's all predicated on what your expectation of future development growth is going to be. The alternative is you can just amass the funds and spend it on infrastructure projects as you see fit. That's the low risk approach. The high risk approach would be, would be of course, the bond. Um, and and as, I, as I said, this is a 25 year program. Um, this bill started out with the state contributing um, and the port contributing as a taxing district. Uh, politics as they were in 2011 in Olympia, the state and the port pulled out um, and uh, the county uh, was, the counties um, were, were left as the only property, ta uh, property tax district involved in the bill. Um, and not a surprise there. These are all the eligible cities under the new law in King, Pierce, and Snohomish counties. Um, Bothell, you're, you guys are unique in, 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 in many ways, but especially in the sense that you split the county boundary. So doing this, and I think Elliot uh, is going to talk more about this, is there's potential to draw a district that includes both portions of both counties. Um, to make this financially advantageous for the city. Um, and that's something that I think we need to explore and engage as, as we discuss this uh, in time. Um, but since the, since the city bridges two counties, um, the portion of the district that's in Snohomish County would be capturing 
Snohomish County general fund property tax revenue. The portion of the district that's in King County would be capturing King County portion of general fund property tax revenue. Important distinction uh, there. Part of this law required the three counties to report to the Puget Sound Regional Council the total number of rural development rights out there from our forest lands and our farmlands. We did that and that number is 18,576. And then the three counties in PSRC went to the task of dividing that 18,576 total number of development rights out there and allocating it to each of these eligible cities. So each city on this on this slide has a number of TDRs under the law that it can accept to, to capture that county property tax mm -hmm. revenue. Bothell's number is 365. Generally speaking, a pretty low barrier to entry. To put it into perspective, the city of Seattle's uh, is uh, approaching about 4,000 TDRs. Um, and the number is based on the city's um, growth targets. It's 2040 growth targets through PSRC. And Bothell can choose, under the law, Bothell can choose to accept between 20% of its allocated share of 365 or up to 100% of its allocated share. So between 73 and 365. The more you agree to take, that is the more you amend your zoning code to require developers to buy TDR, the more of the county's tax revenue you can get. Okay, so it's the, the, the language in the bottom of the slide kind of spells it out a little bit more in detail. If you take 365 TDRs, then you can capture 75% of the property tax revenue in a district. If you take 50%, then you would capture 37.5% of the property tax revenue, which is 50% of 75%. And if you want to take the lowest risk, lowest number of TDRs, then you would agree to take 73 TDRs and you would capture 15% of the county's general fund property tax revenue. And this would be transferred on a yearly basis to the city. And the city has to use that revenue for public improvements as defined under the law in the district that you've identified. Now, public improvements as identified under the law is quite broad by intention. Um, sidewalks, signals, um, uh, all kinds of uh, public infrastructure improvements. The, anything that you could think of for, for creating economic redevelopment is probably going to be eligible under the LCLIP law. But there's no free lunch completely under this. Uh, you, this a, a city has to meet certain performance thresholds in order to continue to receive the county's revenue. That is, before money can be transferred from the county to the city, a city has to have absorbed or permitted into development 25% of what you agree to accept. After that happens, then you have a 10-year runway of capturing the tax revenue. And at year 10, if you haven't permitted into development 50% of what you've agreed to accept, then the county turns off the spigot. But if you reach that 50% threshold, then you get another five years of property tax revenue from the county. And so on and so forth up until, up until, until you're, you're, um, you're 20. You have to have absorbed all of the amount of TDRs that you said you would accept. And then, the rev and then you get 20, you'll get the full 25 years worth of property tax revenue. That's the basic framework of what I call TIF for TDR or LCLIP. Taking the TDR concept, 
of growth management and land conservation, moving development rights from our rural lands, concentrating it into our urban lands, taking that concept and melding it together with um, a form of tax increment financing where, whereby this, the county is willingly entering into an interlocal agreement with the city to transfer its property tax revenue, new property tax revenue from new construction to the city. So the city and the county are kind of in a waltz together, a dance, so to speak, of moving development rights, transferring property tax revenue um, to one another. And that, that's the best analogy I can come to, up to, to describe what a partnership like this would look like, which of course would occur through an interlocal agreement uh, like our previous partners. So um, this is my last slide. I'm going to leave you with that and, and, and hand it over to Elliot to kind of dive into his analysis, which looked at answering the question, how much money could the city capture? How much new money could the city capture from uh, from King and Snohomish counties by drawing a strategic uh, uh, district. Um, and, you know, the county is, is ready and willing to continue discussing and exploring options with the city um, to, see, to see what we could come up with that works for, for both the city of Bothell and, and King County. So thank you. Thank you. Did you want to uh, ask questions of um, Darren at this time I before? I think this would be a good time to okay. have, have give, give the other commissioners a chance to just raise questions. And while we're still at a high level of conversation, there, there's a whole bunch of high level questions I, I'm sure uh, people have. So we'll, we'll, we'll do some of those questions first and then uh, we'll, we'll get into to your presentation. Uh, so that said, any questions? I actually have just one question right now, and I think I want to defer the rest of my questions until after you're done because you'll probably answer the rest of them. But I have a whole bunch of questions written down. What I would like to know is do we have the opportunity after this meeting to um, either via email or some, some other way ask additional questions that you could answer? Gary, maybe you can answer that. Yeah, certainly. I, I think um, yeah, if you have additional questions and you can feed them to me, um, I'm sure Elliot and Darren will both be happy to to help answer those um, and, and get the information back to you, absolutely. I'm guessing a lot of us probably have the same questions, and I'm thinking that if we can, if we do send them in maybe a week before the next time we're mm -hmm. going to discuss this, they could kind of look at them and say. Sure. And this is one of those issues, this is one of those topics that, that we fully expected that it may be difficult to come up with questions right now because you're just receiving this, and it's a lot to absorb. But as Eric said, three or four days from now or a week from now, uh, you may have generated some questions. We'd be happy to, to try and answer those before we meet again. So we would put, give those to you then? I would say use me as the conduit okay. um, to Darren and Elliot if, if um, we need their assistance to answer them. Okay. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions that, uh, and again, this is a lot to absorb, so uh, so bear, bear with us if you would. Um, Darren, it sounds like this is, this is similar to wetlands banking. Is that is that an accurate um, analysis? It, it is, but it isn't. Um, you know, Sound like a politician, uh, uh, <laughs> right? Like a left-handed economist and a right-handed <laughs> economist. You know, um, a, a mitigation wetland mitigation banking or credit sales is often referred to as the mirror image of, of TDR, um, and in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, it is. The only difference is is TDR is totally voluntary in the sense that uh, it's totally voluntary on the developer side. They can either decide to build to the base density that they're allowed to under a zone, or they could buy the development rights to build more density. That's a voluntary decision on the, on the side of the developer who's buying these. It's also a voluntary decision on, on the side of the farmer or forest landowner to enroll in the program and pull the development rights off their property. In mitigation banking or wetland credit trading, it's usually an unavoidable impact that the regulatory uh, agencies are saying, you have to do this if you're going to build here. If you're going to impact this wetland, you have to buy five credits of wetland, and you've got to go to that bank to buy them. So, that, so it's similar 
but it's it's I would say it's a little more on the voluntary side than TDR is than than, than the mitigation banking side. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, so it's more market driven as opposed to uh, policy driven. Then yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and, and again, it sounds like the goal is to redirect development from specific rural areas into more urban areas. Is that that is that is correct? Okay. Um, Could the same thing be done just by zoning changes? By zoning, you can definitely. I mean, that this is the challenge, and this is why why the LCLIP tool is 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 helpful. Because in the past, before LCLIP, I've had to go to cities and say, "Hey, partner with the county on taking development rights through zoning changes," and the city would say, "Well, why would we do that? Because we can just upzone it ourselves." And, and, and I've had to say, well, we won't, we're asking you to think big picture here, partner with the county on this big growth management objective, um, and accept development rights from outside your that, That's a tough sell politically. But now there's a financial carrot on the other side of this, the new revenue, that makes it much more enticing for a city to say, OK, yeah, it might make sense for us to take these development rights from outside of our jurisdiction instead of just upzoning it at will. And giving the density away will require developers to buy this TDR commodity from outside of our jurisdiction because, well, we have some altruistic beliefs in protecting our watershed and growth management, but also because we're going to get all this revenue. So, so, so the answer is yes, but. Okay. Uh, uh, and then the additional tax revenue. Uh, it sounds like the additional tax revenue would come from the increased value from having a a larger uh, development or something of that nature. Is that is that accurate? Is that how does that how does that work? And and that might be answered by your presentation, Elliot. Do you want to take that? Well, sure. um, let me give you the quick analogy because this came up a lot when we were trying to get this through the city Seattle City Council. Is is Let's just say there's a, a parking lot um, in, the, in the area that the city wants to redevelop that's part of the district that's created. Um, its assessed value is X. Well, uh, and I should say the city captures the property tax value on any new construction regardless of whether it uses TDR or not. Okay, so, so the building could just build up to the base, not use any TDRs. It's still capturing that property tax revenue from the county for that new construction. Um, so it went from a parking lot valued at X to a building, five-story building or 20-story building valued at Y. That delta is, is, is the new, is, is the basis of the property tax calculation. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. No, actually you did. That's, that's what I was thinking is it just, it's the, it's the increase in the property tax value based upon a, a, a denser Construction. That's right. Yeah, okay. I, I have a corollary to that, that question before you m move on. Uh, so, right, so the, the land goes from a parking lot to a five story building. Uh, so, so, there's more. How is the taxes split between the county and the city? So, the property tax pie, if you will, is, is uh, split between the state. State takes most of it. Um, uh, uh, the city and, and the county. And generally speaking, the county's portion of the property tax pie is around 18% of that. The state's like 75% and then the city's the remainder. Um, don't, don't mark my word on those exact figures, but that's a rough idea of what it is. So we're talking of the 18% that would otherwise go to the county, we're carving off a portion of that and giving it back to the city. I think, um, Darren, you can chime in on this. It's important to note that the, the city also has to dedicate a portion of their property tax revenues to these same infrastructure improvements that the county property tax revenues, which therefore going for the city, would finance. So um, that's another, in a sense, it's not a freebie, right? Um, you could argue that those general fund revenues for the city would be financing a lot of these infrastructure improvements anyway, but if the county's going to put up money to finance the infrastructure that helps accommodate these bigger buildings 
in the district that you designate, the city too has to take a portion of their property taxes. It's a smaller portion than what the county would give up, but you know, you're getting increased property tax revenues from the higher density or intensity of development, and, and you too have to pay into the infrastructure. That's right. Okay. And then my last question is, uh, you, you said there's districts. Is that is that like uh, an identified specific area for both the receiving site and the and the sending site? It's it's for the receiving site. Um, so you the city would actually draw the district boundaries, um, and, and you want to draw those in such a way that you're they're capturing the areas where you want to accommodate new growth. Um, and where you would upzone for new growth, um, so that's the district that I refer to. Um, it's 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 up to the city to draw that boundary um, within its boundary, and then you uh, you know identify and with the county the sending areas that where those development rights come from to be used in that district. So what's the downside? What are we what are we not seeing? Well, the downside is, it, I don't know if it's a downside, but it's, it's a gamble. It's a gamble because, you know, well, it, it, it's a calculated gamble. And, it, and, and it's, smart, uh, it's smart for a city to do this in an area where they know they want to accommodate growth, where there's the political will to upzone it, and there's going to be market demand in the near to medium term in that area. If if those stars align, if those variables come together, then I don't think there is much downside. I mean, the, the only downside would be, well, we, we could have upzoned it ourselves and given that density to the developers. And, and, then, and then the question becomes, by charging, the, having the developers buy these TDRs, are we st stifling growth in that area? That's that's a question for the consultants to kind of tease out, um, and, and you don't want to stifle growth through TDR. That's not the idea, but the, uh, the with LCLIP, the thinking is you use the new revenues to actually catalyze growth, um, to f to maybe fund some key infrastructure investments that help those early pioneering developers come in um, to 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 get the get the growth you want. So. There's a little nuance there. You want you want you want to charge have developers buy TDRs for the density, but not so stifle growth. But you also want to capture the revenue from the county to catalyze growth. There's a, there's a there's a line to walk carefully there. But if it's if it's voluntary, then on the developer side as well. So it sounds like there's also the risk of, okay, we agree that TDRs are the way to go. The city is somehow obligated to to uh, purchase or, or or transact a certain number, and then developers go, we like the zoning right where it is. Is that is that a possibility? I mean, the possibility is always that the city the city could use its own funds and buy the TDRs themselves. That is, I mean, but th the idea is that you're not using city funds to buy the TDRs, that the developers are buying the TDRs. You're just permitting them into development. The city's not buying the TDRs. That's always an option, but all the cities that I've talked to have said, we don't have the money nor the wherewithal to do that. We want to structure our zoning code such that the, the developers are buying the TDRs for their projects. And so that's the challenge, is structuring the zoning code, giving them enough base density, or giving them, or there's enough demand for the product type that they will want to buy TDRs to build no matter what. Um, and that's, that's what I think Elliot's going to talk to about okay. Canyon Park. So does, does that imply that the cost, if a city is choosing not to buy a TDR, does that imply that the cost of a, a TDR is greater than the expected kickback that they would get from the, the portion of county property taxes? No. No. And, and that's the other rheostat you want to dial in with this is, you know, is think about how much money can you capture from the property tax relative to how much developers are spending on TDRs. And you want, you know, you, you'd want those to be in near equilibrium um, as best you can. Um, right. 
Because it seems like if, if a city could buy a TDR for, say, $1,000, but then get $2,000 from county property taxes, then I would imagine cities would just do go, it. go buy up yeah. all the TDRs. Yeah, well, the answer is timing. Uh, the answer is, is, is timing. The accrual of property tax revenue to the city happens over 25 years. And your big bang for the buck comes in years 15 to 25, but whereas the developers are buying these TDRs in the next five to ten. The so it's flip it's side here that if if then if the cost of the TDR is uh, if if it's on the flip side then are we pulling we we being the the combination of city state county governments is that pulling more money out of out, out of the private sector than we would expect to be getting back from the taxes? Um this, this scenario is something that we've modeled um, for the city before, especially in our King County portion. We call it a gap purchase scenario. Um, we've modeled it for other cities in the region, too. As Darren said, most cities decide that they don't have the risk tolerance necessarily to purchase all of their TDRs up front. But in theory, you could. You could say, we as Bothell want to maximize our, our portion of county revenue, so we're going to take all 365 of our TDR credits that have been allocated, and we're just going to buy them up front. And the purchase price is actually a little bit higher. I mean, it's somewhere around $25,000 per credit as opposed to $1,000 per credit. But the analysis that we've done, and I can elaborate on this further in my presentation, generally shows that it does pay off. You do get more than what you would spend on those TDR credits if you purchase them as a city up front. <clears throat> but, again, it's a matter of risk tolerance because if you can't permit those TDRs into development, if you can't then as a city transfer the TDR credits that you've already purchased up front and already paid millions of dollars for potentially, 365 credits times $25,000 per credit. Two developers, if the market falls out or, or they're just not interested, then you're left with TDR credits um, that, that you can't liquidate. And so you have to assume that there's going to be enough growth to generate enough property tax revenues to pay you back. Our modeling says that typically there is, but that's a risk, and that's a big risk if you're going to shell out a few million bucks up front. You know, all of our projections are based on growth forecasts, but the growth forecasts may or may not happen as PSRC envisions them. So, yeah. Quick follow-up question. Um, seems like South Lake Union makes perfect sense for possibly a gap purchase where you have one known developer that's going to you know, keep going until all the space is occupied. How do you transition into an L clip with, I guess, not as certain of a development structure moving forward? Um, seems like that first year, in order to hit the 25%, you'd have to be certain that you're going to have a um, significant amount of building within the initial time frame. You got it. Um, I'll just comment quickly on this. You know, it might be a good time to transition to, to Elliot's, because a lot of these questions, I think, are going to be embedded in his, in his presentation. But the answer to your question, Patrick, is timing. Um, if I was in your chair, my recommendation would be, sounds like an intriguing tool. Let's, let's be smart about this. Let's do it right before we know and we're going to permit a bunch of new development. Um, you, don't, you don't want to do it after that because then the ship has sailed. You want, to, you want to do this right before a new wave of development is coming into a certain part of the city. And, and, you, and so queuing it up, and this is what Kirkland is thinking about doing, is queuing it up, doing all the policy and process work beforehand so you can hit the go button at just the right time, either through development, when development agreements are, are coming online or, or something is happening, the market's turning in the right direction, it, 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 you know, you can quickly implement this thing in just the right time to, to maximize uh, the revenue to the city. And do you have to get a feeler for the developers on how they'll react to the TDR as that's kind of coming together? I mean, I realize that it should be a net general neutral that whatever added density or reduction in parking should offset the cost and you know make it work financially but um, if you have people looking to submit applications for permits do you have to give them an indication that hey this is coming down the line um, is that something you're interested in or how do you recommend that sure if there were someone who were interested in developing now and they got their permits in 
before you were able to add this policy language and get it on the books, and they'd be vested and they could develop without having to go through the TDR LCLIP program. I think that it's definitely true that there would be an educational component involved with developers who are interested in developing within the city um, after you've written this into into your, your policy. Um, but at the same time, I think, and this is my perception, a lot of developers here in the region are, are pretty savvy, and this is a regional program. It's something that, as Darren has spoken to, um, it wasn't just invented in 2011 with LCLIP. That's when the carrot that Darren mentioned was introduced, but it's been going on um, through the counties now in the central Puget Sound region for a while. So it's sort of a known commodity, and, and I think that that will lessen the learning curve for a lot of developers. A lot of them know that when they're going into many of these markets that they are interested in developing in any way, they're going to be working with incentive zoning programs and more specifically TDR, which is in a lot of ways just a brand of incentive zoning. I, I had another naive question. Um, can, can you clarify, is purchasing a TDR a permanent thing or is it like a rental model where every X years you have to repurchase it? If you, it, it's, a TDR is, 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 can be, can be bought and sold numerous times over and over again until it is used in a development project and redeemed for additional square footage or an additional unit of density. So, um, if you if, if I own a piece of farmland and you're a developer, I sell you a few of my development rights for for your project. You decide, uh, I don't want to build this. I want to sell it to another developer. You can do that, um, and you can and that person can keep selling it. It can trade hands multiple times. It's just like legal tender, uh, it, but the county takes it out of circulation the moment a developer uses it in a project. And the conservation easement in the sending area is permanent as well. So. Right. The, la the, the land from which the development right originated is protected permanently with a conservation easement. That's the legal vehicle that prohibits future development and subdivision of that farm. Mike, can I ask you? Yeah, yeah, please. So you mentioned, Elliot, that a number, an actual number, $25,000, I heard. Is, was that just an example or... Is that a rough value? I, I guess the reason I ask is that your discussion about it passing from one per, one developer to another assumes that there's a, a variable market value. value. And if it's a commodity, it must have some ability to go up and down in price. Is that is that right? I think I'll, I'll actually let Darren answer this one. We're your economics consultant, and we have a good idea of what they've sold for in the past. That's what we base our research on. But there are any number of ways these transactions can occur. Some are market-based. Sometimes the, the price is fixed by the jurisdiction. I understand that to be a little more rare, but Darren has a, a huge hand in managing King County's TDR bank. So he sees all of these transactions, and he would be able to tell you a little bit more about pricing. Mm -hmm. uh, the prices have fluctuated from 15000 to 30000 over the last decade. And if you asked me this question in 2008, 2009, I'd tell you they're worth this much. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, you know, uh, we've got sales volumes and prices and, and volumes of sales through time, and, and it oscillates completely with the strength of the real estate market. Not surprisingly, right? I mean, developers are driving this demand. So it, in the recession, no one was buying these things. So they were worth near nothing. Um, but there's been a pretty strong recovery. And pre-recession, they were selling for twenty-eight to 30000 Now they're, you know, you know, two years ago, they were in the fifteen to 18000 They're selling for twenty to $22,000 now. So depending on, and, and they're worth more in different locations. Mm -hmm. It's not, and this is a common misconception about TDR that you'll hear is, you know, they're worth more used in City X than City Y. Um, so they're really, but generally speaking, fifteen to thirty thousand dollars, regardless of the jurisdiction, is is the price range that we've seen in the market. Um, but but a, a given rural landowner, farmer John or whatever his name is, has has only a limited market that he can sell to, and that's the jurisdiction. You mentioned that South Lake Union is using these 
areas, uh, you know, out a specific area. Mm -hmm. I, he couldn't decide. I want to sell it to somebody in Bothell instead of Seattle, for example. He could if the Bothell agreement allowed was was interested in those sending areas. So you um, can. So two jurisdictions could have the same yes. sending area. Yeah, and there they are. Those jurisdictions have overlap okay. too. Yeah, some do, some don't. Um, but also in the LCLIP legislation is, is you have to cast a pretty wide net of sending areas, but then in the actual agreement with the county, um, you prioritize and deprioritize based on the city's conservation objectives where you want to conserve. You know, do you want to conserve watershed lands or, or more rural farmlands? Um, that's up to the city. So I'm a developer. I'm developing in downtown Bothell, and I purchase a one TDR. How much additional square footage would I be able to to capture? And and and, and maybe yeah. maybe this is yeah yeah. <laughs> this might be a good time for me to okay. head on Perfect. up. Thank you. That's all right. Okay. Well, let, let, let me just do a quick check. Are, are there any other high level questions that 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 uh, the commissioners wanted to ask before we start digging a little deeper? Yeah, it'll be a quick one. Um, just on the sending sites, do they have to be ripe for development, or if a farm's in a flood zone, it's never going to be developed anyway? Would that still qualify, and would they be able to sell their development rights? Good question. Um, most the answer is a little bit of both. We've we've prioritized our sending sites, identified the eligible sending sites based on zoning and conservation priority. And so our perspective on the flood issue is we're still enrolling farmlands that are in the flood plain into the program because we just look at the at the Kent Valley and the Green River and Green River Valley, Lower Green, and and that was a flood plain. Um, and and although development is currently hard in floodplains right now, zoning rules and regulations change over time. And so, but permanent conservation easements don't. So, we are still enrolling properties into the TDR program that have floodplain restrictions because we're taking the long view on it. And I just want to double check one more thing about the, the, just a high level understanding. Uh, when we go between, we talk about a parking lot and a developer comes and they want to build, or, or a field and a developer wants to come and they want to build their five story building. So is it, I, I want to make sure I have the right mental understanding here. So w one option is that the city goes and upzones it. And then, then in that case, there's increased revenue, uh, increased property tax, the county, county, city, and state will get that. Uh, and the city gets our 7%-ish. The other option is the developer goes and buys a TDR, and then the same sort of construction occurs, the same, the same expected economic activity occurs, sa same impact on the property tax, but then in that second scenario, the city gets a, a, a portion of the county's 18% uh, on the property tax. Is that a fair understanding? I think you got it. Yeah, I think you know you have a scenario where the city upzones it and doesn't do any TDR requirements of the developer, and the developer builds a five-story building, and then you have the incentive zoning scenario where the city requires the developer to buy TDRs to get to that five-story building. Um, the tax profile of each of those to the city is a little different. Um, this one, the one where you, you require the TDRs means that the city's capturing a, a portion of the county's property tax where in the first scenario you're not. Okay. But in the first scenario he wouldn't be able to build a five-story building, is that correct? Well, if we upzoned it, he could. Well, yeah, okay. Right, that's, okay. that's okay. the first scenario yeah. is if the city just goes and upzones it. Right. So just, just on principle, uh, I mean, could, could all of these problems be solved with zoning in, in, in terms of getting the, the desired construction this is where Gary's going to answer yeah I'm gonna take a stab at that this is one of the reasons we, we we first decided to look at the TDR L clip program because we know we need to accommodate uh, a population capacity shortfall in the Snohomish County portion of the city 
So, for example, we could just upzone the Canyon Park and Country Village areas and provide for a residential component on those, and developers over time may or may not come in and build that development. If they do, we'll capture that, our portion of, of that economic activity. But it seemed to us that if we need to accommodate that additional population, so we know we need to upzone those areas, why not look at potentially taking advantage of this program if we know we have to do this anyway? It, it, it seemed sort of serendipitous to us, to be perfectly honest, that these two things sort of are coming together at the same time for us. That's why we hired Elliot's firm to take a closer economic look at, at both of those different scenarios and, and tell us whether they think there's a possibility of the, the TDR LCLIP scenario looking considerably rosier than the just the regular development scenario as far as revenues to the city. And that's what we're doing, I think, right now, is we're, we're, we're still trying to make that decision. How, how does this look? Um, and, and, you know, staff will be perfectly honest with you. We're, we're learning this with you as, you, as we go along. I, I'm about a year ahead of you in this process, but that's about it. <laughs> so we still have some decisions to make on this, this whole thing, and that's why we've, we've hired Elliot and, asked, and, and Darren has gratefully very graciously uh, offered to come and speak to us about this because King County, this is an important thing for King County. Um, I wanted to just, just mention one other thing real quickly. Uh, Darren is sitting here from King County, but we're talking a lot about the Canyon Park area. And, and there's nobody sitting here from Snohomish County talking to you. Uh, Snohomish County's program, and maybe Darren can speak to this a little bit more. He may, he may know more than I do about this, but Snohomish County's TDR, TDR program is some ways behind King County's. They do have a TDR program, um, uh, but they're they're not as far along with it as, as King County. So uh, we originally got a grant from King County to study t the possibility of TDR elk clip in the King County portion of the city. So we hired uh, community attributes to do that for us. Uh, we we had to focus on King County because that's where the grant money came from and, and that's where the opportunity was. Um, Elliot can expound, uh, expound upon this a little bit, but um, it, it appeared after Community Attributes did their study that the opportunities in the King County portion of the city for TDR LCLIP are, are probably not as, as ripe as they are in the Canyon Park or Country Village area. So that's when we ask community attributes to expand their study to include the Snohomish County portion. Uh, King County has, as I said, very graciously stayed engaged in this process because it's an important issue for them. And, and, and Darren can speak to that if you, you want him to, but that, that's why Darren's sitting here. Thanks. Uh, but sure. Ali, would you yeah. take to the podium? Are, are these the same ones that are in our packets? I don't think you had a chance to get it in your packet. I just sent it to Gary this afternoon. No. Oh. Okay. So if you'd like to follow on, you have a hard copy of May. What is in your packet is a copy of the analyses that ah. AI has done for us. This is a copy of Tom Elliott's presentation. Right. You. In your packet, I believe, was included a copy of our report, a memorandum, a technical memorandum that would summarize in detail a lot of the numbers that I'll talk about here. So we'll, uh, we'll steam right along here. Uh, thanks for having me as well. I appreciate being out here to talk about this. Um, this is kind of fun stuff for us, and we've got a unique perspective on it, I think, because a lot of our projects are sort of one and done, but as Gary alluded to, we've now been involved with TDR for the city of Bothell for almost two years, and I worked on the King County portion heavily as well. Um, we were working with Darren at that time. As they said, King County graciously funded that study, um, so, so we're having some fun with this, and, and we think it's got a lot of potential. Um, now that I've seen kind of where some of your questions lay and how the conversation has been going, there's one bit of terminology that I want to add into the discussion now that wasn't part of my presentation but I think will be helpful, um, and that is an exchange rate. Um, an exchange rate is the term that we use to describe the increment 
of additional development that a developer gets for trading in a credit that they purchased, a transferable development right that they purchased. And so when Darren put his diagram up there that has the arrows going in both directions and shows that transfer of, of development capacity from a rural piece of land to an urban area where you can then build beyond base density, we actually go in and do the economics to say, based on what that credit, that TDR credit, costs the developer, based on what that additional increment of development that they'd get through a, a lift in zoning is worth to the developer, how do you how do you equal those out? What portion of that zoning lift or of that development capacity do they have to get for every dollar that they spend on TDR credits? Um, so exchange rates can can vary widely based on the economics of the situation. They can also come in different commodities. Um, a couple of you mentioned it could be uh, reduced parking. It could be an increased number of dwelling units. It could be an increased number of square feet allowable in a multifamily building. And we've also tested all those different commodities. You know, Given that we've been doing this for a couple of years now with the city, we've had a chance to, to run through a lot of those scenarios. And I'm going to present just a couple of scenarios here tonight happy to answer questions about others or follow up at another time um, on any of the King County scenarios we ran or the gap purchase scenario that I alluded to earlier. None of that's included in this presentation, but that's all context for what you're about to see. So um, what we did study this time was multifamily projects largely in Canyon Park and your R-AC zoning designation, um, which as I understand it, it doesn't currently exist in Canyon Park. It exists in North Creek and other parts of the city. But uh, when we spoke with Bill and Gary about extending our study to Canyon Park, they expressed an interest in accommodating growth um, because it's, it's a requirement, a GMA requirement. There's a shortfall in Snohomish County right now or in the Snohomish County portion of Bothell, accommodating growth by adding the R-AC designation to Canyon Park. And so when we first tested this earlier in the year, we looked at uh, one scenario. It's a scenario on the left here on this second slide where you could build to a typical multifamily building height, say 65 feet. That's usually enough to get you a six-story building. In some cases, it's five, just depending on floor-to-floor -floor heights. And we would designate a base density that the developer could build to by right without having to go through a TDR purchase. And then whatever is above the base density up to the maximum of 65 feet would be contingent upon TDR. And when we looked at that, um, we found that it was largely feasible. We generated some exchange rates based on the economic conditions, the, the market analysis that we did as part of the study for what we think developers will be facing in that part of the city in the next five to 10 years. And we handed that off, and, and Gary and Bill have reviewed that. But that got them to thinking, if LCLIP then is predicated on absorbing more TDRs and absorbing them faster, and we don't currently have a residential component in Canyon Park, why wouldn't we just make all residential development contingent upon TDR so that we absorb more credits faster? We reach those thresholds that Darren spoke to, and we can, in essence, have a better shot at guaranteeing our revenue stream over the full 25-year period that the county um, is willing to share their, their property tax revenues for. So the scenario on the right illustrates that. You've got the same mixed-use building. In theory, it has the same revenue potential. Um, and outside of a TDR purchase, the development cost would be the same, too. Same finishes, same quality, everything. Uh, but in the scenario on the right, the developer has to purchase TDR credits to justify 100% of the residential construction. Um, for this most recent iteration of the study, we looked at it from three different perspectives because uh, as Gary and Darren alluded to, the risk here, or one of the key risks, is that you would stifle development or stifle growth. You would at least perceptually turn developers away from building in Canyon Park because they think that TDR represents an additional cost on development. And if they could go next door or go to Thrasher's Corner just beyond the city boundary, you know, they could capture the same market, build for the same tenants potentially, but do it without the cost of TDR. Um, 
we looked at this, what we call the single-use developer, the multi-use developer, and the landowner. It's a tripartite test, if you will, to ensure that we're not dissuading development. And each of those three perspectives would have their own sort of economic tests to ensure that this can still be built. And the single-use developer generally specializes in one product type, could be office, could be residential, but that's what they know and that's what they do, and they're not interested in doing something else because they're not comfortable with it. And so for the single-use developer, we wanted to ensure that even with the added cost of transfer development rates, you wouldn't be eliminating the profitability of the project, that you wouldn't be wiping out the gain that they stand um, to receive. And, and then with the multi-use developer, we had to make sure that the residential component wouldn't be unduly burdened by the TDR so as to switch their use calculation to build something else so that they say, well, I'm just going to forego residential because I don't want to deal with the TDR program. I'm just going to build office. I'm comfortable with both. And then from the landowner's perspective, you want to make sure that even if both office and residential is feasible for a developer, office developers can't afford to pay more for the land and thereby outbid residential developers. So that's the tripartite test that we established to test Again, this new question that Bill and Gary put to us after our initial Snohomish County analysis. And uh, if any of that's confusing, I, I don't blame you. Feel free to stop me at any point in time. But when the results came in, all three of them worked. Now, they didn't necessarily work at what we would call current market conditions. But what we do is we always incorporate a rent sensitivity into our economic modeling because market conditions change frequently and sometimes they change in leaps and bounds. One day a developer could expect to get X dollars per square foot for their multifamily building and the next they're doing that plus 10% um, because attitudes around cities change often overnight. And I think that a lot of the development interest in Bothell Landing, for example, is anticipating significant rent growth over the next five to ten years as the city builds out. And that would be a, a very good example, I think, of a situation where what we have available to us as market data says one thing about rent levels and development costs, but what we expect to be the truth once all of this TDR programming and whatnot would be implemented and once the downtown builds out, might have a, a totally different set of economic conditions. And so as you can see in the table, we tested under a, a sort of base rent scenario, a rent plus 5% scenario, and a rent plus 10% scenario. Economic surplus is just a fancy term we use to indicate what the developer has left over after all costs, including land acquisition. So they, they built their building, they paid for the land, so on and so forth. Do they have anything? Uh, left over once they're starting to generate rents. And as you can see at base rent, um, you know, it, it's not looking so rosy. Plus 5%, it's looking a little bit better, and at plus 10%, um, you're getting significant returns such that they could afford all of those costs, which includes TDR. And we're actually seeing that the, what we call R-AC alternative, which is that scenario that I showed you on the right where the entire building is contingent upon TDR, um, pencils for the developer at a, a lower rent level. Um, as such, again, as I said, it passes the tripartite test. It doesn't necessarily discourage residential uses. It doesn't trade off for office uses. I mean, this is economic modeling. It's not a guarantee of future behavior, but uh, it shouldn't eliminate the incentive for developers to build residential in Canyon Park. Now, we circle back around to exchange rates. This top table, again, just illustrates the different scenarios that we modeled, the Canyon Park office, Canyon Park residential, which was the diagram scenario on the left, and the Canyon Park residential alternative, the diagram scenario on the right. Um, it, it shows you, you know, what the base and bonus heights would be. Again, in the Canyon Park residential alternative, uh, residential is not allowed under base density. Um, whereas it would be allowed to 55 feet under the first scenario that we modeled. The exchange rates in that far right column is how this all works. Now a developer, again, same revenue potential from these two multifamily buildings, at a fixed TDR credit cost can only purchase so many TDRs. 
since there's no more revenue coming from the second building, they can't buy any more TDR credits. And as a result, your exchange rate has to go up significantly if they have an entire building contingent upon TDR, but they have to purchase the same number of credits, then they have to get more building square footage for those credits. And the math is pretty simple. The scenarios are the complex part here. But that's why you see the exchange rate in the far right column go up significantly between the two scenarios. That's measured in square feet. So um, in the first scenario, the Canyon Park residential scenario, with a 2,800 square foot exchange rate, it's just saying that if you have a base density um, or a, a height limit at 55 feet, and then through TDR, you allow the developer to build to 65 feet, then any of the square footage above 55 would have to be obtained at a 2,800 square foot clip by buying TDR credits. For every one credit they buy in exchange, they get 2,800 square feet above 55 foot height limits. In the residential alternative scenario, they have to get 11,000 square feet for every TDR credit they purchase because they have that fixed number of credits and they now have to get all five or all six residential floors of the building for those TDRs. So exhibit three, table on the bottom, sort of cuts to the chase with regards to the revenues. And this is only the Snohomish County portion of revenues. As I mentioned earlier when I was sitting down, the city of Bothell would have to dedicate some of their property tax revenues to infrastructure as well. But if you're the show me the money type, this is sort of what you could expect to get out of it based on several assumptions about the revenue streams that would be coming in over the next 25 years. Um, Darren illustrated quite well that it depends on how many credits you accept. And so we've provided three allocation ratios to sort of show you the range. If you accept all 365 credits, that's a 100% allocation ratio, which means you can get up to 100% of King County's 75% of tax revenues. And that could give you somewhere between six and eight million dollars in revenues over the life of the district, roughly. The growth scenarios are another sensitivity we test. They're just variations on the PSRC growth forecasts so that we can give you a little bit more context about you know, what to expect if growth doesn't come or development doesn't come as quickly as you had expected, or, or what if it's really just booming out there and you get a lot more than you expected. How, how much of a difference in your revenues does that make? Can, can I interrupt for a second to ask a question? Absolutely. Um, so on, on that first row, if, if we get, uh, if the city gets $7.5 million back, how much did the developers have to spend to buy all of those TDRs? I can grab a calculator. It'd be, you know, 365. I guess what I want to know is if it's more or less than the 7.5, because if the oh, developers had to spend more to buy the TDRs, then the city would get an increased tax revenue, then something, somebody's losing. As oh, I recall, it is 9.1 million. I, th I think your numbers are in, in present value terms too, right? Yes. Those, those discounted are. back. So the absolute value of 7.5 is probably double that. Be higher. Well, not double, but. A lot more. Yeah, so at, at, at 25,000 times 365, that's, that would cost developers about nine, 9.1 million to buy all the TDRs. So if the developers are spending more to buy the TDRs, then the city would be getting in, in, in county taxes in that additional revenue stream. It, it, it seems like something's losing. Well, as Darren said, this is in net present value, which just means that we've discounted it to, to account for future inflation. So when you calculate the amount that developers have to spend, that's not on an equal footing with the numbers that you're seeing here necessarily. Um, if we were not looking at this in net present value, that number of seven or eight million would likely be substantially higher. Um, what it, I, it I would tell be, you exactly yeah. what the number is off the top of my head. Okay, bye. Okay. So invariably, you know, the, uh, the lower allocation ratios give you a, a smaller stream of income. 
the real reason to look at lower allocation ratios is if you were uncertain about your growth and you wanted to ensure that you were hitting those thresholds that Darren described. Because of course, though you're accepting a, a smaller portion of King County's property taxes, you're also making those thresholds easier to hit by accepting fewer. You only have to get 25% of the 225 TDRs to reach the first threshold, or 25% of the 73 TDRs to reach the first threshold. So if you want to maximize the, the stream of revenue in terms of its lifespan and get the full 25 years, but you weren't as bullish about your growth forecast, then you might choose to accept fewer. What our analysis showed was that, you know, based on growth forecasts and really in the high, low, and baseline growth scenarios that we tested, there should be enough growth in the city to utilize all 365 development rights or credits. And our recommendation, um, purely from an economic standpoint, would not be to, to take a lower allocation ratio because the modeling says that you'd be foregoing revenues that you would otherwise be entitled to. So that's the gist of it. That's what I brought. I'm happy to answer other questions because, as I said, there's a lot of, there's a lot of history here that we've had with the city in exploring other development scenarios. And this is pretty technical stuff. So by all means, uh, feel free to ask questions now. And then I'm happy to take questions later or in the coming weeks through Gary as well. Uh, thank you. That does another great time to Surface any questions that anyone has? Eric? Yeah, I've yeah, um, got a few things. That some of them are related to your presentation, others are more general. Um, so, if I'm a developer and I want to purchase some TDRs, how do I get paired up with a, the sending site? Is there a database of these, or how, how does that work? Yeah, the, the, the county has a um, um, we're always we're kind of the market maker, if you will, fielding putting buyers and sellers together. We have a website, and we've got uh, you know online credit marketplace where buyers and sellers find each other. They call our office, we put them in, we give them the list with contact info of sellers, um, and and the county is also actively buying these development rights from high conservation lands, and we have a bank of credits available to sell. So we're buying them, selling them, taking the money treating it as a revolving fund and going buying more conservation lands with it. So we're also, you know, bridge. The, the challenging thing with TDR markets is having a developer who's ready and willing to buy these things and a landowner who's ready and willing to sell them. It's a timing issue. So the county's bank steps in and bridges that time gap and buys them, holds them, sells, and, and acts that kind of intermediary role. And um, I lost my train of thought there. That That really helps, though. Um, so are there are there so you guys are I guess not a broker but you're kind of a middleman is there are there could we expect that at some point there would be real estate agents out there or some sort of agent out there that's working with these sending sites and saying hey I'll go market your TDRs for you and you know and I'll take a cut or something like that is do you see that happening yeah yeah potentially yep Okay. Yeah, and to a limited degree, yeah. Um, you mentioned that pro obviously property taxes would increase for the for the receiving sites. Is there a corresponding decrease for the sending site when these conservation areas are dedicated? Do you, are you seeing that? Great question. Um, the answer is, in theory, yes. Uh, but the way the assessor values property um, and, and so we, we've seen both no change and we've seen a decrease. Never has it increased, yeah. um, but it either stays the same. Uh, but, but the way the assessor looks at these, sometimes a um, – because uh, the assessor doesn't value based on speculation. Uh, and, and so um, they – you know, sometimes a property is, is worth just as much without the subdivision potential as it is with it because – the assessor says, well, a large rural estate has as much value as, you know, five, ten acre lots. Um, so so it, it's kind of caught into the, the way the, 
the the county assessor does the batch assessment of land um, and sometimes we don't see a change in value sometimes it, it goes down was so there still are you saying there's still like a reasonable use exception in place where a, a landowner that sold all his TDR still has some residual development potential on that property no but usually what we don't see is a property owner a vacant piece of farmland or forest land usually what we see is a house on a 50 acre farm and and they're selling off the remaining development rights associated with that so never do we have very rarely if ever do we have someone taking all the development potential off a piece of property they keep a house okay. either existing or for future use. and when and when you if the county does go and purchase those TDRs from and then kind of put them in their bank the the conservation aspect of this goes into effect immediately upon purchase it doesn't wait for those TDRs to be applied to a development immediately upon purchase okay. yeah last question um, you, you talked about a, a total bank of TDRs at 18,000 or something like that in the in, in King County um, that requires that there's a willing seller for all of those too right I mean there's there's going to be people out there that would say I'm not selling my TDRs for any any amount you're correct. And that, that 18,000 figure is the total number of theoretically available development rights on farmlands and forest lands in Pierce, King, and Snohomish counties. That's not the bank. The bank is what we, King County, have actively bought from no, I'm lands. No, I'm not suggesting yeah. that, but I'm, what I'm saying is that if, if you've allocated a certain percentage of the, this 18,000 to different jurisdictions somehow, I'm assuming that um, you're you're leaving some available for other jurisdictions that sign oh, yeah. up, yeah. and eventually that all those would be taken. But it doesn't. It's not realistic, obviously, for all of them to be sold. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, exactly. I mean, realistically, you know, given normal landowner spectrum of landowners, most landowners will say, "I'm not interested in this." So of that, you're right. Of that eighteen thousand theoretically available, there's only a a percentage of those that are actually willing to put a conservation easement on their land. Do you guys have an estimate of what that is? Um, I would probably say less than 10 percent, mm -hmm. realistically. Yeah. So you're looking at more like a realistic, like 1,800 available TDRs in the three counties? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's it would be way too altruistic to think that. I mean, that represents all the unprotected farmlands and forest lands in the three key. I, I don't think all those landowners right. would be coming ready to do this. Um, yeah. Yeah, Pat. Thank you. Gary, this is kind of a process for you, a question for you. We have the Stonewash County portion that we have a capacity. We don't have capacity. When do we have to have this adopted? Can this... So can we, when do we have to have the, the up capacity adopted for our plan? When is that? Well, and, and Darren can help me out here a little bit. Our thought was that as far as this periodic plan and code update, what we would like to think about doing is just um, sort of setting the table for the TDR LCLIP program. So in other words, having goals and policies in place and code language uh, as necessary to to essentially say we want to participate in this and start the ball rolling. Well, that's my question. So we're, we're not looking to have the details. We're, we're looking no, to say that as I, part of our long-term plan, we're going to, we've, we were. Correct. And, and, and maybe Darren can talk a little bit about more where Kirkland is at, because I think they're in, in roughly a similar position that we're in at the moment. They're trying to do this as part of their plan update as well and get the ball rolling. So um, we're thinking, my question is we'll be able to get, we can assume we'll take a high level and then we can work on that plan moving forward. I, I believe that's the case, and, and Darren can correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that's our intent. That's our. our if it's me, and if, 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 I, if I'm in the city, you know, and if it was just me, you know, I would, this is a timing thing, right? And I want to have, I want to reach out to people saying, hey, we're going to bring residential into Caney Park area. I'm going to want to get the value. I mean, so, I mean, there's going to be some negotiation here to make sure that I bring this on in time to, to collect these TDRs at a, at a date certain. And what we know now is that we we haven't had anybody in the Bothell area 
take advantage of the RCAs yet. We just haven't. We haven't seen that yet. Correct. And that's but why, um, we, you know, um, both Darren and Elliot said that a big portion of this is timing. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of development in the RAC zones yet, but RACs, yeah. but we we do feel we do think that sometime in the next five to ten years, um, if we if we uh, provide the plan designations for that, uh, I think we I think we will start seeing it. Yeah. Uh, but it is a timing thing, and, the, and there is some risk involved. So I think as part of this planning code amendment, our hope is that we can, if this is something we want to move forward with. Get the goals and policies and, and and basic regulations in place to allow it to happen, and then um, you know so we can be in a position, as Darren said, to move on it when when it looks like development's going to happen. Thanks. There's a risk there in in getting a little bit. For example, the King County study. I think when we were hired on to to study Bothell Landing, it's a little bit too late. One one because uh, the new zoning had already been put in place, and so there, there wasn't the political will. And just from a real estate development standpoint, it didn't make a lot of sense to give an up zone beyond the height limits that had already been approved for the downtown area. Nobody wanted to see buildings to 85 feet or to 95 feet or to a height that would have made a significant difference above and beyond the 65 feet that you had already approved. But secondarily, because a lot of those projects were already vested, um, it, the, the Six Oaks project that's already in, right? That was permitted by the time we started doing the study. And so one thing I want to point out, and correct me on the l -clip technicality here, Darren, if I'm wrong, but your 25-year clock doesn't start ticking until you hit 25% of those permitted credits, at which point you have another 10 years to hit the second threshold. So putting the regulations in place early doesn't hurt you because you're not losing years on the revenue stream until you start the first threshold. You would always put the regulations in place when you feel it's prudent to do so from a, a policy standpoint or a political standpoint, uh, just a logistical standpoint. And then when development starts happening, you're ready to accept and, and transact those TDRs. You can start the clock on the 25-year revenue stream as soon as you get 25% of them permitted into development. There's a, there's a risk to being too late with this as a, in addition to being maybe even more so than being too early with it. Yep. Just a general question about the market that surrounds us. In your report, you have cap rates for Bothell based on a pro forma um, for building residential and Downtown, how does that compare to our neighboring cities? I don't really see a chunk of land that's as open for development changing over to multifamily in Kirkland or you know the nearby municipalities. But um, just besides TDRs potentially driving people away, do you look at Bothell and see that it's advantageous to build on at five and a half, six percent cap rates? Does that match up pretty well with neighboring cities? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think Bothell's in a, a good position relative to the development climate in the central Puget Sound region. Um, you know, we see lower cap rates elsewhere. Cap rates are, I mean, we won't get technical on cap rates, I suppose, but they are a measure of risk, at least informally. And so there are certain markets where you know, maybe downtown Kirkland is perceived to be a less risky development opportunity than Canyon Park would be. Um, almost certainly, but maybe than downtown Bothell at this point because downtown Bothell is still being built out, whereas downtown Kirkland has all the infrastructure and amenities in place. I think that we'd want to see rent growth in Bothell to, to feel really good about development here the way that we do elsewhere. But as I said earlier, I also think that's coming. It's just a matter of where in the development cycle you're at. Other places like Kirkland might be if not primary markets in the region, then secondary markets in the region and some of the other suburban municipalities that are a little bit smaller, uh, such as Bothell. We also did a we did the TDR study for Sammamish, also funded by King County last year at the same time we were doing your King County study. You know, a place like Sammamish is absolutely a tertiary market here, and it's not that development won't come. It's not really even a matter of cap rates necessarily as it is expected rents um, because the purchase price and the resulting cap rate should reflect the, 
the revenue potential, we'd want to see rents come up a little bit, I think, in a place like Sammamish to feel good about um, TDR costs there. And to be clear, it's trending that direction for Sammamish as well. I mean, in general, this is a really healthy development climate, um, and it is cyclical, so, you know, might be good now, and you'll be down for a few years, and then back up for five, six, eight years. But um, I think it's a healthy outlook, generally. One, one comment I would, I would make to Elliot's report, it kind of gets to Mike's question in, in comparing how much money the development community is going to be spending on this density commodity called the TDR relative to how much money the city is, 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 is getting. And hopefully, I don't know if your report st says it, because when we did all these modeling for other cities, it's really important to look at the, you know, compare apples to oranges, that is, it's seven and a half million, but of of a much larger amount discounted back after 25 years. So it, the discount period is quite long, um, and I don't know what discount rate you use three, four percent, or something like that. I think three percent. So that number of seven and a half million in in total terms is probably closer to around you know 13 to 14 million dollars, um, and the city's getting the large majority of that later. You know, in the you know once the you're not getting that in the first five years, you're getting that after development comes in over time, and and the, and the overall construction in that area has gotten to such a level that you're getting the majority of that in in the out years, in years ten through fifteen, and you're getting a lot of it, um, and that's why it discounts back to such a, a lower number because it's happening further into the future, where the TDR sales are happening early um, so so maybe I don't know that that port page or exhibit in your analysis might help Mike understand that the difference between the, the 9 million of developer purchases of TDRs and the 15 or 14 million discounted back to 7 million it's important to look at through that lens to kind of fully answer that question I think th th thanks for the clarification uh, David, did you have a? Yeah, I just had a, a general question. Is, I'm pretty uh, excited about this program. This seems like a great program that the the government put forward. Um, one thing I'm having a hard time wrapping my uh, my head around is that might help all of us here and maybe anybody watching on TV is like when you say a TDR, like a credit, like what does that translate to when I think about a farm or a forest? And, and I know that probably varies a lot, but what does that kind of translate to when you're thinking about, because the premise of this whole concept, I guess, is conservation. Yep. And so w what is one conserving when you have, like, one TDR or right. credit or whatever? Yeah. So you're conserving the, the right to build a house on a piece of farmland or a right to build a house on a piece of forest land. Um, so 80-acre zoning in forest lands. You're removing, permanently removing the right of a... Of a thousand acre forest to be subdivided into 80 acre lots. One TDR represents one 80 acre lot or home site. Um, and similar on rural land, it represents a home on a five acre lot in the rural area, um, in the ag lands in the rural area. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, so Process-wise, how, how how should we continue? I don't know if people have. I'm sure more questions will continue to trickle in. I, I heard a few times commissioner saying, "Oh, one last question." Yeah, and, and I don't yeah. think there will be any la last questions. We'll well, the land use element is going to come back to you more than once in the future. Um, so I would I would encourage you to to keep digesting this. Send us send me your questions. Um, if you have them, we'll we'll try and get them answered for you. Um, at some point, um, I'm thinking now probably not on the November 12th meeting, but probably the subsequent meeting after that, um, I will probably, I would like to come back to you with some, uh, maybe proposed goals, policies, and code language that might, that might kick this off. And I'm gonna, you know, have to lean on Darren a little bit to, to help, help me do that. But I think that would be the next step, would be to receive questions back from you, get your information back. And if, if you would like to see some draft um, language, I think that'd be the next step. 
to, to set the table, so to speak, for the, for the program. Because I think what I'm hearing from the Commission as a whole is, is an interest in continuing to explore this and, and bring it forward, if, if I'm not mistaken. I, I, I think that's fair. Uh, I'm cl clearly a lo lot, lot of questions. Yeah. You know, definitely something. But I don't think, I'm not hearing, um, you know, we're not interested in this. Uh, let's just end it right here. Is that be a fair assumption, I think? I think okay. that's, that's a fair, fair, fair assessment. Okay. So does that make sense to you, or is there a, a different path you would prefer to see us take, or? Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, the, there's a lot of questions going. It, I mean, we may come to that conclusion next time or, or, or the next time. But, yeah. But I don't think. I, I think for all of us, myself right included, it would, it would, I, I think it would help to move up to the next step to maybe start drafting something and, and see what it looks like and, and try to get our hands around it and say, okay, are we headed in the right direction or, you know, are we setting ourselves up to, to do this in a, in a responsible manner? Um, I, I, I personally feel as though mentally I've, I've gone about as far as I can go right now with this and I think I get the concept and it looks like there's some benefits to it, but I think we need to take that next step and, and come up with some draft goals, policies and language and and try and wrap our hands around it, if that makes sense to you. Yeah. I, okay. So that was the focus of the land use element tonight. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly complex, heavy stuff, so I didn't want to try and open up anything else in the, in the element tonight. I just wanted you to try and tackle this, wanted us to try and tackle this. So um, if, the, if that works for you, um, that's what I was looking for tonight. Okay. And, and any other questions on on TDRs before we? Move on? All right. Then, uh, from a process perspective, how, um, how how should we proceed? Well, I have one more item on the agenda for you for the um, the planning code update. That's the North Creek one, Northeast One Ninety Fifth Sub Area. I have a couple comments on that before we we um, move away from that. Uh, but with regards to the overall um, the land use element and the overall hearing. Once we get done with North Creek, I'll just have you continue the the public hearing for the plan and code update to November 5th, which I think is the next date. So process-wise, that's that's where we're headed. Um, uh, if if uh, so, we can keep the public hearing open because it's one public hearing for the whole thing. Um, so we can move on to the next item. Uh, if you uh, if you don't think you have any more questions for Darren and, and Elliot, we'll let them take off uh, at this point. If if you're good with that. And um, I'll talk to you briefly about the, the sub-area plan. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Thank you both. Thank very you. Good, very yeah. nice. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. So also in your ha packet, you have the um, Northeast, uh, sorry, the North Creek, Northeast 195th sub-area plan. Um, Bruce originally brought this to you. Um, a number of weeks ago, and this is the second review of it. Uh, you didn't have any comments the first time through, and um, we weren't too surprised. This is essentially a fairly simple sub-area plan with, with very few changes. We're really just basically updating the language to bring it up to date. However, I did um, identify a couple of issues um, between sending you the packet and, and seeing you now. It occurred to me that there are two things that we do need to to add to the update in this, and I'll point them both out. The first is um, in the background section for the, the sub-area plan, and it's in the, the section regarding parks and open space on NC-3, page NC-3 in, in, in your packet. It occurred to me that we need to uh, mention uh, the city's purchase of the North Creek Forest. Uh, which is within this sub area. Um, that, that's something that I think Bruce just overlooked. So I, I, I'm sorry. I don't. I, I'm looking at NC3. I don't see a backgrounds. I see historic properties, commercial development. Yeah, it's it's essentially under the major heading sub area profile, and then it goes location, physical geography, built environment, and under um, under built environment, um, there are a number of subsections, including historic properties, commercial development. And it's under parks and open space, I think, is where we would put it. Oh, okay, that, and thank you. I think we just need to mention that the city has, has uh, purchased that property. The second item that I noticed um, before the 
the meeting tonight is on page NC-10. So back in the policy section, uh, we're still sharing a section for community services in this sub-area. And as you know, we're proposing to eliminate that element from the plan. So we should eliminate that section. Uh, there are no policies specific, sub area specific policies under it, so I think that's all we need to do in this case is eliminate it, is, uh, is cross it out. Um, and under housing, we should, we should revise that title to read housing and human services to be consistent with the major plan elements. So those are the two items that I identified before meeting with you tonight since your packet went out. Other than that, we're not, we're not um, proposing any other changes to the element. Uh, if you would like, I can bring you the element back one more time so you can, you can review those, or I can simply bring back your, your FYI review copy as we've been doing with the major plan elements um, for your growing stack of, of reviewed uh, items that you're, you're accruing. If you're, if you're okay with those changes, I'll be glad to just do that. And I'm seeing nodding heads, so. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I'm okay with the changes. Did anybody have any comments? Mm. Okay, seeing none. Yeah, it sounds like we we are we're all great on that. Okay, perfect. So, in terms of of process, we are scheduled to come back to you um, on November fifth, which is next Wednesday. Dave will be here, um, and he will bring uh, three sub area plans to you: the Shelton View Meridian, Maywood Beckstrom Hill and Queensboro Brentwood Crystal Springs, and those are all an initial review. Um, so with that, um, I just need a motion from you to continue the public hearing for the 2015 Periodic Planning Code update to November 5th. And, and uh, just before we do that, can, then can you clarify when when do we continue the TDR discussion? Is that on the 12th? Yes, I have, well, I have the land use element scheduled to come back to you on the 12th. Um, I think, w Given our discussion tonight, I'm going to switch gears and go back to the, the rest of the land use element and bring you language for that. Um, there are some issues in there, including the number of unrelated persons uh, living in a single family dwelling. Um, I indicated to Mrs. Harkonnen that we would definitely revisit that issue on the 12th. So I think I'll bring you back the rest of the element except for the TDR stuff, mm -hmm. and then you'll see the TDR draft goals, policies, and code language come back at a, a slightly later date. Okay, that, that, that sounds good. I, actually, I like that because it gives the commissioners a chance to... I, yes. I think we're all digesting. That was a lot of information. I agree. And, and we'll have a bunch of questions that we'll send to you, and, and you can forward on to... I agree. To, uh, and and I think... Um, Elliot? I was probably being a little enthusiastic with myself when, um, when I said in the staff memo that I'd hope to bring you back a complete element, including draft TDR stuff, but... I, I don't think that's going to be as easy for me to pull together as I thought it was, and and uh, um, for some other reasons that I'll get into after we're we're off camera, I'll I'll I'll, I'll let you know why that was a little enthus over enthusiastic up front. Okay. So that's the plan now. Yeah, actually, I I also like that because I think we still need to iterate through some high level questions, which would be good to do before we go write the very specific code. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Then. I uh, uh, maybe, maybe what I'll shoot for then, I'm um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but maybe what I'll shoot for then is we'll focus on the, the plan aspects of TDR for the first time we bring it back and look at goals and policies. Um, if, some, if Darren has some plan language, uh, sorry, some code language from other jurisdictions that, that we can bring you to show you, we'll do that. Um, okay. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll sort of play it by ear and, 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 see, and see what yeah, Darren's got. I, I think for TDR, just given the amount of questions that we had, uh, and a lot of these are still v very abstract questions about, okay, how, yeah. what about this concern or that yeah. concern? I think the discussion still, we started at the 90,000 foot, and I, th I think we're down to the ten or 5,000 mm -hmm. foot, and, mm -hmm. and code feels like you're down to 100 feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, or on and, the ground. I don't think we're quite ready for, for that <clears throat> level of detail yet, but okay. uh, we're, we're getting there. My, my gut feeling talking to Darren and Elliot is that for what we're attempting to do at this point, and that's, as I said, has set the table for TDR and LCLIP. I don't think we're looking at hugely complex, large amounts of goal, policy, and code language. I think we can do it fairly simply. That's my gut feeling, have, having talked to Darren a fair bit. Um, but I admit, as I get into it deeper and we start actually looking at language, you know, maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. I don't think so. I think I, I think we can do this fairly simply. So that's our that's our hope. Okay. Well, then at, at this point, 
I'll entertain a motion to move the public hearing on the 2015 periodic plan and code update to continue that on November 5th. Motion to continue the 2015 periodic plan and code update to November 5th. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Let it be shown the motion passed unanimously. So, uh, study session? Sounds like no. Any old business? Reports from staff? Uh, I have none tonight. Reports from members? Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Somebody's a second. Second? Second. second.